It's Medicosis once again with another rheumatology video. In previous videos, we have talked about how to aspire the joint fluid and to analyze it. We've talked about the physiology of the joint fluid aspiration and the pathology of the joint fluid. Today, I'll talk about the synovial effusion. With that being said, now let's get started. Here is just a sample of my previous rheumatology videos, so please subscribe and join the tribe. In my playlist about fluids, hemodynamics, electrolytes, and acid-based disturbance, I've talked about the total body water, intracellular, and extracellular fluid, and the extracellular is divided into plasma, interstitial space, and transcellular fluid, which means within an epithelium lined space. We have examples of transcellular include the three Ps, the serous membrane, serous, sorry, pleura, pericardium, peritoneum, and two lymphs, perilymph and endolymph in your inner ear, and one sino, synovial fluid. Three Ps, two lymphs, one sino. Where does the transcellular fluid come from? Of course, it comes from the plasma. Where, do your, um, where does urine come from? From the plasma. How about sweat? Sweat comes from the plasma. How about your precious crocodile tears? Of course, they come from the plasma. Any fluid secretion comes from the plasma. Okay, here's a joint, here's a synovial fluid. Where did it come from? Of course, from the plasma. What's the purpose of this synovial fluid? Lubrication, decrease friction, shock absorption, etc. It's like mechanic. It's like the same purpose of the engine or, or the oil in your engine. Excellent. Since the synovial fluid comes from the plasma, if you have hyperuricemia in the plasma, you will have lots of uric acid in the synovial fluid. Makes perfect sense, like father, like son. Systemic inflammatory diseases will cause synovitis and arthritis. You have inflammation all over your body. Uh, no wonder the inflammation can spread into your joint and cause you synovitis and arthritis. Septic arthritis of the knee can lead to the spread of infection into your blood. That's why septic arthritis is an emergency. In my second video in the playlist of rheumatology, the video is called Rheumatology Learning the Basics. We have talked about the anatomy of the bone and joint. Here we have the cartilage, articular cartilage, and you have bone, and then you have the synovium. Here's the synovial fluid, and here's the synovium. Outer is a joint capsule, and the inner is the synovial lining cells. Composition of synovial fluid. Hyaluronic acid, produced by type B cells, which are fibroblasts or fibroblast-like. Lubricin, the protein of lubrication, an excellent name, by the way. Collagenase and proteinase. The synovial fluid is a non-Newtonian flow type of fluid. What the flip is a non-Newtonian fluid? Okay, there are two types of Newtonian viscosity. There are Newtonian and the non-Newtonian viscosity. Water is Newtonian. Can you explain that to me? Indeed, Newtonian fluids such as water, their viscosity doesn't change by changing stress. For example, if you put water in a plastic bottle, and then press on it, push it, shake it, squeeze it, or even stand on top of it, the water viscosity is not gonna change. It's not gonna happen no matter how hard you try. On the other hand, non-Newtonian fluids, such as your synovial fluid, their viscosity changes by changing the stress or the shear forces. So, your synovial fluid is non-Newtonian. That's why we measure its viscosity on joint fluid analysis through arthrocentesis because the viscosity of the synovial fluid changes by changing stress. And why is this fluid non-Newtonian? Because of the great hyaluronic acid. Therefore, if you have increased stress over time on your synovial fluid, you'll have increased viscosity of the fluid. The viscosity of the synovial fluid is gonna, gonna increase thanks to stress over a long period of time. So what happens when your engine oil becomes so thick, you need a tune-up. So in cases of meniscal tear, you have increased shear forces and stress on your joint, which will lead to increased viscosity of synovial fluid. And for the first time, you understand why, thanks to this great mechanic. How to measure the viscosity of this great synovial fluid? So here's a normal joint. You aspire the joint or tap it. This is called arthrocentesis, aspiring the joint. And you watch for this. You get the needle of the syringe and then you drop the fluid. 
and watch it until it hits your desk or the floor or whatever. You measure the distance between the needle and the surface. Normally it's between 2 and 2.5 centimeters. This is called the manual method. How about if the viscosity is not normal but it's low? If it's very low, the float will drop like water, you will not have any strings, no strings attached. Now, some crazy lab technicians will do this test, but not from the needle, but by putting the joint fluid in a test tube and then break the tube, let the fluid fall and measure the distance. Don't do that, don't waste resources. And then when the accountant yells that the last quarter wasn't profitable, the lab technician surprised, I was doing this in the name of science. No, honey, you could have done the same freaking thing by using a syringe and not a test tube, also in the name of science. Resources are not free, even if you are not paying for them. Nowadays, the viscometer is doing all the heavy lifting, so the lab technicians can watch what's new on their Instagram, and then they wonder why their salaries are not keeping up with inflation. Hey, Congress, do something! Viscosity of the synovial fluid can be normal, can be low, can be high. How about normal? Normal joint, of course. Traumatic arthritis and osteoarthritis. Okay, how about low? in cases of inflammation or infection. Why? Due to disruption of the hyaluronic acid. Give me an example, rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, you have white blood cells, debris, increased volume called joint swelling. All of this will dilute this viscosity. And if you wanna be sophisticated and go back to physics, here is the force. Here is the viscosity coefficient, which is constant for the same fluid. But in case of arthritis, the fluid is not the same. It has changed. So the eta will change in rheumatoid arthritis. A is the area, V is the velocity of the fluid, D is the distance. So the eta equals force times distance over area times velocity. Therefore, eta, the viscosity coefficient, is inversely related to the area. In cases of rheumatoid arthritis, you have increased the area called joint swelling. Therefore, the eta is going to be low. It's called physics, baby. What else? Rheumatic fever, gout, septic arthritis, all of these are inflammatory slash infectious and they can increase the volume of the fluid called knee swelling, increasing the area and decreasing the viscosity coefficient. Also, they alter the nature of the fluid by adding white blood cells and debris, so you get a lower viscosity fluid. How about high? In case of meniscal tear. Why? Because of sheer stress forces for a long period of time, as we have discussed before. By the way, a mild increase in viscosity is actually good for you. It decreases friction. However, if the viscosity is too low, the fluid is too thin, it's useless. The two layers will come in contact more often, leading to increased friction, decreased lubrication. That's why rheumatoid arthritis patients can get joint stiffness. I think I can work as a mechanic. Normally, the adult joint has synovial fluid volume of less than 3.5 milliliters. If it's more than 3.5, this is called effusion. Definition, excessive accumulation of synovial fluid. Normally, less than 3.5. Non-inflammatory, more than 3.5. Inflammatory, more than 3.5 mLs. Permanent, more than 3.5. Causes of effusion. Non-inflammatory, such as osteo. Inflammatory, such as rheumatoid, lupus, gout, Jogren, etc. Purulent such as the septic arthritis, which is a medical emergency, and then there is hemorrhagic. To chest, traumatic tap, you injured the patient while inserting the needle because you're an idiot. Trauma, it's not your fault, the patient already had a trauma like yesterday, and today they have blood in the joint. Bleeding disorder, such as hemophilia, again, this is not your fault as a doctor. How about bleeding disorder, such as thrombocytopenia? As Consuela might reply, no, no, no. Why not? Because thrombocytopenia is a problem with platelets, a problem in primary hemostasis. And as you know, problems with primary hemostasis will lead to superficial bleeding. Something like petechiae, purpura, uh, thin cut, stuff like that. However, secondary hemostasis problems, such as the coagulation factor defects, will lead to deep bleeding, such as bleeding into joints called hemarthroses, remember? But I thought this was hematology and not rheumatology. Honey, your brain is not just boxes sitting beside each other's. It's interconnected and integrated neurons. I have the perfect schnellus ultimate notebook about lymphoma. Contains everything you need to know about lymphoma in 100 plus pages. Plus, you get 20 lymphoma cases and for a limited time, you get 25 bleeding cases for 50 students only. 
then those cases are not going to be available at the same with the same package so please hurry up go to patreon.com forward slash medicosis thank you so much in advance back to the hemorrhagic effusion in case of traumatic tap there is bright red blood it's called fresh blood pigmented villonodular synovitis it's dark red to brown trauma dark red malignancy dark red What's traumatic tap? It's when you injure your patient while inserting the needle. Here's the famous table, normal, non-inflammatory, inflammatory, and prevalent. I've discussed this table in the previous two videos, so make sure to watch them. Some tips for the pros. The longer you wait, the lower the white blood cell count is gonna be in the joint fluid aspirate. So you should run the test as soon as possible. Otherwise, the white blood count will continue to decrease and then you will misdiagnose the patient as normal when in fact they have an inflammatory arthritis. Don't do that. Culture has only 50% sensitivity, which is garbage. This is just like flipping a coin. So if the culture is negative and you still suspect infection, order its synovial tissue biopsy. But you should start empiric antibiotic immediately and don't wait for the stupid lab tests. If you find lipid globules on joint fluid aspiration, it means there is an intra-articular fracture. Why? You know this bone? Yep, it contains something called the bone marrow. The bone marrow contains fat globules. When you have an injury or a trauma or a fracture, these fat globules are going to spread from the bone marrow into this intra-articular space called joint, and then you'll have lipid globules on joint fluid aspiration. So intra-articular fracture, the bone marrow fat leaks to the synovial fluid. Easy piece of cake. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, medicosis schmeezy. Now let's have some fun. How to differentiate between hemarthrosis and a traumatic tab? This is not your fault, but this is your fault because you injured the patient while inserting the needle because you're a stupid doctor. So let's say you are performing an arthrocentesis on a patient's knee. And for some reason, there was a lawyer watching you. The needle aspired some blood from the joint. And then the lawyer shouted, Aha! Blood! You, the doctor, caused it. And I'm gonna take you to court and sue you for malpractice. This is how you should reply, okay? Look, you foolish, stupid person whose parents are cousins. First, the blood is dark colored. So it's not a traumatic tab. It's not caused by me. The patient already had blood in his joint before I did anything. Second, this blood doesn't clot because, for example, this patient can have hemophilia and by definition hemophilia, they do not clot. So if this blood doesn't clot, it means it's not me because normal blood, uh, it does coagulate. That's why the patient is already bleeding in the first place. And third, after centrifugation, this blood turns yellow due to red blood cell destruction and the release of bilirubin. This is called xanthochromia. Xantho means yellow. That's why we have xanthelasma, which is like areas of fat around the eyelid. This is seen in patients with hyperlipidemia. And chromia means color. That's why the logo of Google Chrome browser is colorful. This process takes 6 to 12 hours to occur, proving that the patient already had blood in his joint for 6 hours or more. It's not my fault, sir. I rest my case. And that's how we talk to an enthusiastic ignoramus. Look, when you argue with an attorney, don't wrestle him with the legal stuff because he will beat you every time. You stick to your circle of competence called medicine. Because what does a lawyer know about xanthochromia? Nothing. He spent all of his adult life learning about the different types of jurisdiction. <laughs> you just disbarred him. If you don't know what jurisdiction is, ask your attorney or Google it using Google Chrome as a browser. You don't have to go incognito for that. Since medicine is bloody well connected, no pun intended, and integrated, let's have a neurology integration. We can apply the same concept of xanthochromia. Let's say you have a cocaine addict, hypertensive female patient complaining of the worst headache of her entire freaking life, projectile vomiting that hits the ceiling. She is a little confused and disoriented to place. She isn't sure if she's in a hospital or a KFC because the Colonel Sanders is also dressing in white. There is some fever and some seizures. You rightfully suspected 
subarachnoid hemorrhage. Great job, doctor. You ordered a CT scan of the head without contrast because this is how you should detect blood. But the CT scan came back negative for bleeding. What should you do next? Answer, you should do a lumbar puncture and look for xanthochromia. So you inserted the needle between L1 and L2 or between L2 and L3, I don't care, and you found blood. Oh well, but since you are familiar with the French philosopher René Descartes, I doubt therefore I am, you started to ask yourself, if this is this blood from the CSF or did I cause it by injuring the patient while inserting the needle? Now to the centrifuge to get your answer. If you found xanthochromia, I have good news and bad news. The good news is you're innocent. The blood is not your fault. Yay! The bad news is you better bloody disconnect your Wi-Fi and act quickly because this patient might die. The head you should elevate. The patient you gotta ask to hyperventilate. You better give labetalol to reduce blood pressure so that blood pressure can mitigate and thereby reducing the chance of hydrocephalus. Give nemodipine to prevent vasospasm. And you might have to call the surgeon and even drive him to the hospital in case he has a flat tire. He needs to get his butt off the couch and show up and insert an external ventricular drain to manage the hydrocephalus before that foolish attorney comes again. And here is the great slide about the normal joint fluid aspirate. It should be colorless, clear, the consistency thin and stringy. Do you remember the numbers? Two to 2.5 centimeters. This is the viscosity. What types of studies should you do on joint fluid aspirate? Gross examination, cell count, microscopic examination, and culture. If you are a mnemonic maniac, color, crystals, cell count, culture. Awesome. All right, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and hit the bell. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and Instagram. Go to patreon.com forward slash medicosis to get my notes and get my bloody Dropbox cases where you can view, download, and print them. Enjoy, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionals, where medicine makes perfect sense.